Hey, good afternoon, cadets. It's Lieutenant Colonel Baker here, and we are going to go over first aid, lesson one, first aid emergencies. Okay, we've all either seen or been in an emergency uh, situation where somebody gets uh, critically hurt, or it might have been a minor injury. It doesn't matter, but you need to be prepared for any situation, and that's why we have a first aid. There's three lessons in this in our curriculum. So let's begin with the first one. Okay, so as always, you know that we have our essential question. How can you determine the need for a first aid in an emergency? It's real important to make an accurate assessment when you come on somebody that either is unconscious or hurt. Okay? You must take the proper steps so you don't uh, further injure that person. Okay? So, Think about what you know about first aid emergencies. Okay, just roll that in your head, okay? Uh, we're gonna define some uh, key words here. Okay, but what is first aid? Everybody has a definition in their head of what first aid is, but here's the book definition. Immediate care given to a victim of injury or sudden illness before professional medical help arrives. And you might ask yourself, well, who's professional medical help? That would be the paramedics or the EMT, or maybe a doctor. Hey, after you call 911, that's when those professionals will be dispatched to your location to help uh, that injured person, okay? That is what first aid means, okay? So, a first aid supply kit should include bandages, antiseptic ointment, aspirin, tweezers, and that's right, disposable gloves, okay? Disposable gloves are your first, first line of protection against you as somebody providing emergency aid, getting um, bloodborne diseases on you or things like that. You know, we have a first aid kit here in my office that has a ton of gloves, okay? Because you don't want to get yourself sick while trying to help somebody else out that's uh, injured. Okay? It's very important. Okay, Remember, accidents happen anywhere. You could be walking up the stairs of your house and twist your ankle. That's an accident, and you fall up the stairs, not down. Okay, Then you need to figure out what to do in that situation. Okay, You always need to be prepared for any emergency. Hey, I have a first aid kit in both of my cars. You never know what can happen. You could be in an accident. You could see somebody get into a car accident. And you can render first aid to them and help them possibly save their lives. Okay, So you need to always be thinking about that. You always need to be prepared. Okay, So here are some of the words you'll notice here. Define the key words, conscious, contaminated, we already defined what first aid was, fracture, good Samaritan laws, immobilize, paralysis, persistent, shock, universal precaution. So let's define these words here. Okay, so universal precautions. They said those are actions taken to prevent the spread of disease. Okay. How do we uh, stop the prevent of the spread of the disease? Well, the gloves, face masks now, okay, because with the COVID, right? That's why we wear the face masks. So contaminated, that contains something harmful, okay? Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if you have a drink that's been laced with arsenic, that's been contaminated with a poison, you can't drink that, okay? The Good Samaritan Laws. These are laws to protect volunteers from lawsuits if medical complications arise after they administer first aid. I mean, there's a reason why we have these Good Samaritan Laws now, because for a certain period of time, people were getting sued because they were trying to help that person who was critically injured. Okay, <clears throat> Imagine that. You come up to somebody... Hey, their neck is broken and they need they need critical medical first aid assistance, but you're not going to give it to them because that person has 
you don't want to get sued and lose your whole livelihood. Okay, that's why they put the Good Samaritan laws in place. Thank goodness they have. Okay, conscious. Okay, that is awake, aware of what is going on. When you come into a victim, a uh, accident victim, the first thing you want to do is see if they're conscious. Because if they are, you can ask them questions on, hey, where do you hurt? Uh, what happened? Okay. And then from there, you can obviously call 911 as the first step, but then start rendering medical aid based upon what they're telling you. Okay. So it's very important. Okay. So shock. Shock is a serious condition in which a person's organs aren't getting enough blood or oxygen. Okay, you'll notice blood or oxygen, serious organs. Uh, organs. So you're talking heart, your liver, your lungs, things like that. Obviously, your body needs oxygen to survive. Okay? Fracture is pretty self-explanatory. That's something that's broken. Okay, Immobilize. That is to keep from moving, to stay still. If you have a fracture, you want to immobilize it so it doesn't get injured further. Okay? And then paralysis. Okay? You are unable to move. And persistent. That is repeated or constant. Okay? So that's something that's, you know, it could be, you could ask that conscious victim, um, does it hurt? Yes, it, it keeps hurting and it hasn't stopped. So it's repeated uh, pain that he's feeling. Okay. So let's go on. All right. So think about the most important things you should do in an emergency. Okay. So what is first aid? I already went over this. Okay. The immediate care given to an injured or ill individual to keep him or her alive or to stop further damage until qualified medical treatment can be administered or professional medical help is the other definition set. Okay. So here are some of the things that you need to be prepared in case of an emergency. Okay. You have emergency phone numbers. There are some locations that don't have 911 in their community, believe it or not. So then if you're in one of those locations, you need to have the right number down written. Okay? You also need to have family health records, you know, whether they're allergic to certain drugs or medications or what medications they're on right now. Hey, these are the things that you need to be prepared. Uh, <clears throat> let's say you get into a severe auto accident and they want to administer a certain type of medication to you and you're conscious and you understand no because that will uh, react with my medications that I have now and it'll cause further damage okay then also where first aid supplies are located you should always have a first aid kit in your house and in your car especially and then maybe out in your garage or your shed because those are those locations that you're using tools that can cause um, severe injuries if, if used improperly okay so first aid kits okay let me pull up first aid kits here this kit is a selection of supplies for getting first aid first aid kits have different contents depending on who is with the kit together you can buy a kit or put one together yourself some of the typical items found in the first aid kit include instruments such as tweezers and scissors, such as a thermometer, cotton swabs, blanket, and cold pack. Medications to include antiseptic liquid, sterile eyewash, activated charcoal, hydrogen peroxide, and aspirin. Such as gauze pads, adhesive tape, and adhesive bandages. As well as additional miscellaneous items such as a small flashlight, tissues, hand sanitizers, disposable gloves, and face masks for rescue breathing. Okay, so. If you have a first aid kit, hopefully you guys do. Um, you should, uh, actually you should open it up and make sure that none of the stuff in there is expired. 
I know in the military, we had to combat lifesaver bags that we were constantly making sure that everything in there was not expired because, hey, you're out in the battlefield and somebody gets severely injured. And, and usually it is severely injured when you're in a war zone. Hey, you need to have the right stuff in there. Okay, Same for you with your first aid kits in your car. Okay, Please get some first aid kits put in your car, especially as teenage drivers who have a propensity to get into an accident more than uh, an experienced driver. And that's just because you guys haven't driven long enough. Okay, So why do you think a kit would include gloves and a breathing mask? So think about what we talked about, contamination, right? Okay. Self-explanatory, a breathing mask for CPR, especially now with COVID, right? We don't know. <clears throat> it can be transmitted. You don't know what can be transmitted when you're trying to give life-saving treatment. Okay, That's why the, the first aid kit should contain those two things at a minimum. Okay, so here are what gloves do. Right? They prevent the spread of disease. Self-explanatory. Okay? Blood or other bodily fluids may be contaminated. You do not want to get contaminated while you're trying to, to administer first aid to somebody. Okay, So make sure that you check those first aid kits and that they have those in there and that they are still usable. Okay, That's the key. they got to be usable. You can have gloves in there, but they might be dried out, and you try to put them on, and they just rip, and so they're useless. Okay. All right, so here are some guidelines for an emergency. Um, I'm going to go over the seven life-saving steps that you should do. Okay. So the first thing when you come on, when you come to an injured person, you should check to see if the victim is conscious. Okay. You ask in a loud but calm voice, "Are you okay?" Gently shake or tap the victim on the shoulder. Watch for a response. If the victim is awake and appears to be choking, first aid involves clearing the person's airway. If the victim does not respond, okay, then you need to check for breathing in a heartbeat. But if the victim is conscious, you ask him or her where she feels different or unusual or where it hurts. Okay? If they're not and they're unconscious, you have to check for breathing in a heartbeat. Okay, so you look for the rise and fall of the victim's chest. Listen for breathing by placing your ear one inch from the victim's mouth and nose and feel for breathing by placing your hand or cheek about one inch from the victim's mouth or nose. Check for a pulse on the victim's neck. Okay, if the victim is not breathing, render, render first aid for non-breathing victims, okay, with no pulse, that would be CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That is why the state of North Carolina requires every student in high school to pass a CPR exam before they can graduate. I think that's a great idea because you never know what situation you're going to be in. Okay? I was in a situation with my one-year-old grandson who started choking, okay? He was at his birthday party. Never thought I would have dealt with uh, clearing an airway of a baby. Okay? So step number three, you check for bleeding. Look for spurts of blood and blood-soaked clothing. Look for entry and exit wounds. Okay? So you now have to render first aid for bleeding victims. You must stop the bleeding. Okay? Pressure is the key to that. Okay? Number four, you have to check for signs of shock. Okay? Shock is a serious condition that can be caused by heat stroke, blood loss, or allergic reaction, severe infection, poisoning, severe burns, or other causes. When a person is in shock, his or her organs aren't getting enough blood or oxygen. If untreated, this can lead to permanent organ damage or even death. And remember, your brain is an organ, and it needs oxygen to live. Okay. Here are some of the signs of shock. It includes sweaty but cool skin, paleness, enlarged pupils, rapid breathing, rapid pulse, weakness or fatigue, dizziness or fainting, vomiting or nausea, changes in mental status such as agitation or nervousness. Okay. 
In step five, you need to check for fractures. Ask the injured person where it hurts and if he or she can move. Check the location of the pain. There may be bruising or swelling if there is a fracture. In some cases, a broken arm or leg might look deformed. Hey, I've had a few broken bones and it's really freaky when your, your bone is twisted in an unnatural position. Okay, for some reason that did, really bothers me. A lot of things don't, but that does. Okay. <clears throat> if the person, injured person cannot move, check for a neck or back injury. Neck or back injuries can cause paralysis. Okay. You know, if the person does have a fracture, you need to attempt to immobilize the injured area, okay, putting a splint on both sides of it so it doesn't uh, get further damaged. Okay. Moving someone with a neck or a back injury can cause permanent damage. You see on the football field, uh, people that have been severely injured, they put them, they immobilize them completely in the, on those stretchers, okay, because they don't not, you don't want to cause further damage. <clears throat> okay, the sixth step is check for burns. Okay, determine the seriousness of the burn. Okay, burns are described as first degree, second degree, or third degree. Okay, you need you got to evaluate the burn and treat it based upon that degree of the burn. Okay, and the number step step number seven is check for a head injury. Okay, some possible signs of serious head injury are. Pupils of eyes are unequal in size, slurred speech, confusion or sleepiness, loss of memory or consciousness, headache, dizziness, vomiting, paralysis, twitching, or fluid drainage from ears, nose, or mouth, or wounds to the head or face. If you've ever had a concussion, you know that dizziness and headache and vomiting are some of those symptoms of it, okay? So you have to be careful. That's why, you know, if you're riding a bike, always wear your helmet, wear your safety gear whenever you're doing something. Okay, do not ignore it. That includes eye protective eyewear, especially if you're out there running a chainsaw or something and things can fly into your eye. That's why you need to have your eyes protected. OK, so it, <clears throat> guidelines for emergencies. You can see over here you need to recognize the sign of emergency. Okay. So in other words, it tells you to use your senses. If there's smoke, people shouting, loud noises, something's going on. You know when there's an emergency. Okay. Remove immediate dangers. In other words, protect your own safety first. Okay. You got to take care of yourself first before you can help somebody else. And you only move the injured if they are in immediate danger. In other words, if you keep them there, let's say the car's on fire. Okay, and you, you need to drag them far enough away from the car in case it explodes. That they're not going to get hurt or yourself. And okay, remember, you thank goodness we have the Good Samaritan laws. Okay, gather your information and take action. So that whole steps one through one and two, you're gathering information. And, and then you need to figure out what actions you need to take to help render assistance for that person. And then call for help if needed. Always, 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 always call 911. Okay. Get them out there. But it depending on where you're at, it could take a little while. That's why you need to render assistance as soon as possible. Okay. Okay, so here's some of the questions that you should um, <clears throat> you'll learn how to treat common or minor injuries, but however, if you're faced with helping someone who is seriously injured, you'll need to call 911 for help, okay? Here's some of the reasons why you should call 911. If, if the victim is unconscious or if they have trouble breathing, has persistent chest pain or pressure in his chest, you can see that he's bleeding severely, okay? Uh, has <clears throat> persistent pain or pressure in the abdomen is vomiting. Okay, has seizures or slurred speech or a persistent severe headache. Or appears to have been poisoned. I mean, that can happen. And has injuries to the head, neck, or back, or has possible broken bones. Okay. 
you calling for 911 and for help can save someone's life, okay? especially if you don't know what to do. Okay? But that's why we want to teach you how to be prepared in those situations. Okay? Okay, when you make the call, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. Okay, So you need to speak slowly and clearly. I know that you'll be charged with adrenaline because it's a could be a life or death situation. And if you cannot speak clearly, they cannot figure out what they need to do to, to render assistance to send somebody to help you. Okay, you have to identify yourself and the phone number that you're calling from. Okay? You must give your location and or the location of the injured or sick person. That's why when you come onto the scene of an accident, look at your surroundings. Maybe it's on the highway near a mile marker that you, you happen to notice, and that'll, that'll narrow it down for the, the ambulance when it's sent out. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> you need to describe what happened as best as you can. You know, Give essential details about the victim, the situation, and any treatments you have given. Okay. Let the emergency operator ask you questions and tell you what to do until help arrives. Okay. Take notes if necessary. And then you're the one to hang up last. The emergency operator may have more questions or advice for you. Okay. So hang up last. In addition, they might want you to stay on the phone with them until help arrives. They will give you that order on what you should do. Okay. So here we have, when checking an injured person, the first thing you should find out is if the person is, that's right, you guessed it, conscious. Okay, remember, if they're conscious, you can ask them, hey, where does it hurt? Where's the pain? What's going on? Okay. <laughs> to find out if an unconscious person has a pulse, you should feel for the pulse at the person's neck, always at the neck, not at the wrist. Okay. All right, you are playing basketball with some friends when one of them takes a bad fall. When you check him, you notice that his foot is not pointed straight. You should not. That's right. Straighten his foot immediately. Okay. I love the C where it says, ask him to get up and get back in the game. Okay. Obviously that foot is broken. Okay. It's in an unnatural position. All right. So you are babysitting your two year old brother who is sick. He has been throwing up for the last four hours and can't even keep down water. You can't reach your parents. You aren't sure if this is an emergency situation. You should. <clears throat> That's right. Call 911 or an urgent care center for help. Look, your baby brother hasn't even been able to keep down water. Okay, and it's been thrown up for the last four hours. So something is, you know, wrong with him. Okay. All right. So gathering information about an injured person may help you decide what kind of first aid is needed. Even if you're unable to provide first aid, this information is vital for, that's right, you guessed it, providing information to an emergency operator okay, when they get there. Okay, so think about using what you've learned to respond to an emergency situation. Okay, we have some scenarios. Pull this up here. Okay, these are some scenarios that I want you to, you'll notice in the directions, obviously it's not in a group right now because you're watching this and you're probably on an online learner, okay? So read the scenarios and figure out how you would do it. What would you do to help that person? So there's six scenarios, okay? Um, actually, this is gonna be one of the homework assignments for this, so you need to actually send this in with your uh, recommendations for each scenario. Okay, it'll be posted on the Google Classroom. Okay, I will post it on the streams when I'm going over it. Seems like you guys respond better to the stream because you get an email that there was something posted. Okay, instead of actually going into the uh, class drive folder. Okay. All right. So these are some of the reflections that I want you to uh, at reading those situations. I need you to answer these three questions for that homework, okay? Now, well, I went over the seven life steps, of the seven life-saving steps. All this information is also in your cadet textbook, which is on the cadet smart portal. That's why I keep having you guys go in there and look at this stuff, okay? And <clears throat> here's the other 
homework assignment that you need to do from and this is the first aid um, performance assessment task these three questions right, need to be answered in a document and sent to me for your homework grade okay that is also will be posted on the google class stream okay now there's a bunch of uh, in case you guys haven't figured it out, I pull all my um, quiz questions from mainly the questions that are on the slide deck. An injured person who is conscious is awake and aware of what's going on. Disposable gloves are a precaution used to protect first aid providers from <clears throat> contaminated bodily fluids, blood, saliva, okay, urine, things like that. Okay. First aid is... Immediate care given to a victim of injury or sudden illness before professional medical help arrives. Okay. A broken bone is often called a fracture. I like that, a crack. <laughs> well, it's cracked, all right, but it's called a fracture. Okay. That's right. Good Samaritan laws are laws protecting volunteers from lawsuits if medical complications arrive, arise after they have administered first aid. Okay. When giving first aid to someone with a potential broken bone, you should immobilize the injured part to keep it from moving. Remember, you can put a sling on the arm, maybe if your shoulder's jacked up or something happened to your arm, okay, or <clears throat> splints for a leg that needs to be immobilized, okay. Paralysis is the inability to move, often caused by serious neck or back injuries. Those are the ones that you must not move further at all. That's why you have to immobilize that person completely. Okay. Persistent means the repeated or constant. You know, the pain is persistent here in my abdomen. Okay. Shock is a serious condition in which a person's organs aren't getting enough blood or oxygen. Okay. All right. So hopefully you guys learned some stuff. Um, the, the cadets that are actually uh, in the class, there's there's some games that we have to play on our curriculum manager. So um, that concludes the uh, lesson. Thank you.